So this is the Shannon Wong podcast number one with your host, me, Shannon Wong. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a husband, father, son, student, teacher, servant, and leader. I'm an ophthalmologist or an eye surgeon specializing in vision correction surgeries, including LASIK, laser lens replacement and cataract surgery with presbyopia correcting lenses, and corneal surgery. This podcast is just a concept. It's definitely not my day job and it's a hobby, but I found communicating via videos on YouTube to be very helpful for me to share some of my thoughts on topics related to my profession, medicine, and more specifically, ophthalmology. We run our private practice here in Austin called Austin Eye, and we work hard every day to create an outstanding organization of people who deliver great service and care to help people see their best over their lifetimes. At the most fundamental level, our medical and surgical practice is a small business. We have a staff of about 50 that includes doctors, nurses, clinical and administrative staff that we, uh, that we care deeply about and who help us deliver exceptional care to our patients. Since this is podcast number one, I don't have a clear vision yet as to what we may create in future podcasts, but it will involve topics that I have an interest in, such as medicine, business, technology, human relationships, or just life. Basically, I have a lot of things going on in my mind, and this podcast may serve as a vehicle to share with you what is on my mind. Additionally, I've been blessed over my lifetime to get to know some awesome individuals, awesome human beings. We might use this podcast to introduce you to some of my friends that you might like to know a little bit more about, who, if they share their story with you, it will help inspire you to do more in your own life. To that point, we have a special guest today, Jose Martinez, and let me introduce Jose, also known as Pepe Martinez, all right? Uh, So Pepe, or Dr. Martinez, uh, completed his bachelor's degree at the University of Texas at Austin, where he graduated with honors, and then he completed his medical degree at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School in Dallas. He then completed a transitional internship at Parkland Memorial Hospital in Dallas, Texas, and then went to Atlanta, Georgia, where he completed a residency in ophthalmology at Emory University School of Medicine. And then finally, he completed his fellowship training in vitreoretinal surgery at what is considered by most to be the best, if, if not one of the best, the very best ophthalmology program in the country and possibly the world, which is the University of Miami Bascom Palmer Eye Institute. He holds academic appointments at Texas A&M Health Science Center, College of Medicine, the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, and the University of Texas Dell Medical School in Austin. So welcome, Pepe. Thank you. All right. So we're going to talk today a little bit about floaters and we see them in our practice all the time probably every 15 minutes we have a patient who says doc i i see something floating around in my eye or there's a blob or there's a cloud floating around and it's super common granted our population is mainly people who are 40 and over but i'm going to read a an email that was sent to me about two weeks ago from a gentleman who had cataract surgery. He had a laser cataract surgery with a panoptics implant. And he said, frequently my vision, Dr. Wong, is like looking through glasses that have a thin film of Vaseline on them. Uh, Eye drops do not help, and I can't predict under what conditions the blurriness will come or go, but it does come and go. I experience symmetrical opaque discs moving across both eyes. And I think these are the floaters that you described, and I was hoping you could remove them. Um, he described that they they were not there before his cataract surgery, but they cropped up after cataract surgery. And so I emailed him a link about floaters, and I said, if you do not have floaters before surgery and have them after surgery, that can happen. 
In all likelihood, you would have developed floaters as part of the normal aging process, even if you did not have eye surgery. And this is super common. And, and then I actually shared with him your, your website and gave him your name and one of the name of your associates. Um, but what we find is that if we're dealing with people who are over the age of 50, uh, I would say a majority of them develop floaters. And from what I read long ago, about 75% of people over their lifetime will develop floaters. Um, we generally advise patients that it would have happened um, just as part of the normal aging process. We tell them, hey, uh, dry eye, floaters, cataracts, gray hair and wrinkles, that's just normal father time related uh, developments and um, unfortunately we, we generally just have to reach acceptance and live with it um, if they have a very discreet floater we'll tell them well we might be able to uh, use a YAG laser to reduce its severity or its intensity but if it's a if it's a bunch of floaters or they're amorphous and they're they're large and they move in and out of their line of sight and they kind of interfere with their ability to function, then we'll, we'll say, hey, maybe you should go speak with Dr. Martinez at Austin Retina, and then they'll end up seeing you, and what is your experience on floaters? Yeah, so, you know, whenever we see patients in our office with sudden onset of floaters, our biggest concern is ruling out a retinal tear, which can sometimes be associated with a floater, and vast majority of times there's no tear, but we take a good look at the peripheral retina to rule that out first and foremost. But otherwise, once we've ruled out associated pathologies that we can often see with floaters, at least in our office, we often see it. Um, we have a discussion that hopefully these things will go away. Often patients, quote, neuroadapt. They just kind of get used to seeing them and their brain learns to filter them out. And they can live normal lives with floaters that they see in certain situations more than others. Often if there's high contrast situations, I often tell people if they're I know I notice them a lot if I'm on a plane and I look out the window, I can really see my own floaters quite, quite easily. And so if you're in a high contrast situation, patients tend to see them more. And so we just warn them of that. But otherwise, most of them just learn to live with them and they diminish with time. I do tell them that if they spike, if they increase, it's important they be re-examined to make sure there's no retinal uh, pathology, no retinal tear specifically. Uh, but otherwise, they can expect to, to notice these. And most patients... You know, probably 99% of them are fine with that, and they go on their merry way and live a, a very uh, productive life. And then there's the rare patient that you've alluded to that becomes very symptomatic. And even after giving these at least six months to kind of go away or, or diminish to where the patients are used to them, if they continue to persist and bother the patient and really disrupt their normal daily activities, some patients will say everything from when I drive, I have a lot of glare from these floaters in my eye, which are usually significant floaters. I had one patient that was a professional golfer, and he said when he was trying to read the green, the floaters were bothering him. So he was really motivated because his his life his, his livelihood was dependent upon really being able to read those greens. So you have a, a wide variance as to patients and their visual needs. And rarely, if patients are highly bothered, they hadn't gone away, we'll have a conversation about doing surgery to actually remove the floaters. And we really try to talk patients out of doing that, but sometimes they opt to have that done, and we go through the risk and benefits of surgery. Uh, there, since it is a surgery, we never want to take it lightly because there are complications. Namely, a retinal detachment would be the biggest feared complication with any type of surgery due to the eye. Well, we can actually enter the eye and remove those floaters uh, using an aspirating machine that just sucks them out, essentially. And most patients that have that done are highly appreciative, they have their floaters gone and they're, and, and they're very happy. Uh, but I do caution that, hey, there are complications that occur with this surgery, so we really try to talk patients out of it. Um, you alluded to the laser. We, we also have a laser that we do use very rarely, um, only because we have found through using it that that laser is great for very focal Floaters, if there's like one floater that the patient can clearly identify as the source of their frustration, and we examine the patient, we can see that floater, and we're confident it's the floater the patient sees, we will apply uh, what's called YAG vitriolysis to that floater, and often the patient is happy with that intervention, which probably carries a little less risk than an actual surgery. 
But I have found through the years that that seldom is the case. Usually it's a, it's a, it's a lot of floaters that patients see or perhaps a haze that they see in their vision that usually is not amenable to this YAG vitreal lysis. So those are my comments on floaters. Is there any... So do you do floater surgery or it's called a vitrectomy, uh -huh. harsh plane of vitrectomy? Correct. Uh, do you do that procedure on patients who still have their natural lens inside the eye? Rarely. Uh, there are some patients, you know, usually they're pseudophagic. They've had cataract surgery, the vast majority of them, because when they have a vitrectomy, their risk of cataract formation goes up. But I have had a few patients that are just adamant about floaters they have. And I told them, you're going to probably develop a cataract in this eye much sooner than you would have. And so it's not, uh, so there are situations we'll, where, where we'll do a vitrectomy on a patient with significant floaters. Uh, and, and I like to call them vitreous opacities, which kind of gives them more of a significance uh, because it really does affect their vision. And they may have a drop in vision of a line or two uh, with a lot of symptoms. So they do not have to be pseudophagic necessarily. Okay. Let's say they are, they've had a cataract surgery and they have a lens implant and they're very bothered by their floaters. They go to see you and what do you tell them about the risks and benefits of the procedure? What's the risk of something bad happening? What's the risk, what's the chance that my floaters will no longer be a bother to me? Yeah, so I tell them the, the, the surgery is very successful, that uh, most patients say there's a definite reduction in the floaters. Most say that they're all gone. Every now and then we'll have a patient say that they see one or two residual floaters, but they're usually very happy. I tell them there's about a 2% chance that they could get a retinal detachment in the eye after surgery, and that's something that can be fixed 97% of the time, but a small subset of patients that develop retinal detachments get severe scarring in the eye that makes that retinal detachment very difficult to fix, and they could end up with poor vision in that eye. And theoretically, they could even lose the eye if it's a severe retinal detachment. So that's always something to keep in consideration. So we never want to enter surgery lightly. The other thing I tell them is, as mentioned, that they'll probably develop a cataract if they have not already had cataract surgery. But this particular patient you're presenting has had cataract surgery. Uh, I tell them there's about a 1 in 5,000 chance they could get an infection in the eye, which itself can be the source of vision decrease. That's very unlikely, but that's possible. Uh, those are really the main things I hit upon when we do the surgery is the fear of retinal detachment and, 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 and infection. But otherwise, uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing. Most patients that have the surgery that have significant vitreous opacities are very, very pleased. They're sometimes some of my most appreciative patients because it really makes a difference in, in, in their livelihood. Um, they usually have very crisp vision to begin with because they've had lens implant surgery, cataract surgery, and so they're really looking for that really, really, really clear vision. So they're very happy usually. Uh, but every now and then we'll have that complication, which, which really gives us pause to not just jump into these eyes and do the surgery on everybody. Right. And then has this, are you doing this type of procedure more often now in the year 2020 than you were, let's say, in the year 2010 or 2015? Is it a more common Yeah, procedure? there's no question. I mean, we actually talk about doing uh, these surgeries at, at the national meetings now. There's still... Uh, I wouldn't say they're, they're um, I don't think every retina specialist is doing vitrectomy for vi significant floaters, for, for, but, but it's definitely become more accepted. And uh, we actually have discussions uh, during the meetings whether we should be doing these cases or not. And there's usually a point and counterpoint. And I, and I would say most retinologists that I respect are definitely doing it, and those subset of patients that are really symptomatic. And historically, in the year 2000, I mean, to do a, uh, a vitrectomy for, for floaters would have been frowned upon. But as most things in medicine, as we become more adept and better, we have better equipment, uh, these things become more routine. The risk profile goes down, so we're more likely to uh, integrate the surgery into uh, what we offer patients. So there have there been developments in the techniques or the instrumentation that is used for the vitrectomy surgery that makes it safer now than it was five, 10 years ago? That's correct. Yeah, the instrumentation now is smaller. It's smaller mm -hmm. gauge, so the actual instruments we use, uh, it used to be we had to throw sutures into our wounds we made during vitrectomy surgery, and now with 25 gauge instrumentation, we don't need to do that anymore. 
So these are self-sealing wounds. Uh, just the technology, the cutters are much more efficient, faster, and so they, they uh, exert less traction on the vitreous gel, which reduces the risk of retinal tears during surgery and, and, and retinal detachment subsequent to surgery. So yeah, so the, the cases are safer now because of the, uh, the advances in technology and the instruments we use. So what do you tell patients about how common floaters are in your experience? And who gets the floaters? Who are, what's, what are the subsets of patients that are most likely to have floaters? Yeah, I think like you have pointed out, I think it's an aging phenomenon. I tell them with the passing of time, you're going to be getting floaters. The key is making sure if there's a spike in them to come in and let us take a look to make sure there's not an associated retinal tear. And I tell folks pretty much everyone's going to get floaters at some point in their life. Um, and it's usually due to this vitreous gel in the back of the eye that naturally separates from the retina, called a posterior vitreous detachment is the technical term. And this is a normal change that occurs. I tell folks that have had cataract surgery, there's a recent study that documented about 50% of patients who have cataract surgery who did not have a posterior vitreous detachment before their cataract surgery develop one within a month of their surgery. And so they can, you know, so this is an often when we see patients, they just had cataract surgery a month before, uh, and they come in complaining of a sudden onset of floaters. And so if I have a patient that's getting ready to have cataract surgery, I'll often mention that to them, that there's a good chance you'll have a lot of floaters afterwards. Just come in and see us. Let's make sure there's not a tear in your retina. Uh, so those patients that undergo cataract surgery, if they haven't had a posterior vitreous attachment beforehand, they're likely to get one, about a 50% chance. Uh, otherwise, it's kind of the natural occurrence. If those that have never had cataract surgery, eventually they'll probably get a posterior vitreous detachment in their lifetime is what I tell them. Rarely do we see patients in their 80s that have not had a posterior vitreous detachment. So it usually occurs in our... Uh, the more nearsighted a patient is, the more likely it is to occur earlier in life. So we'll have nearsighted people with significant myopia. It may present in their 30s or 40s with a posterior vitreous detachment versus those that are normal sighted and may be in their 60s or 70s when they present. So it's a high, high variability, high range. But typically at some point in our lives, if we live long enough, we're gonna have a posterior vitreous detachment, which is usually associated with these floaters. So let's say we have 100 people who have a posterior vitreous detachment, they have floaters, and they happen to go into your practice and you evaluate them. Out of that 100, how many do you think actually end up having surgery to remove the vitreous floaters? Boy, I, I'd say less than 1%. Okay, very uncommon. Yeah. It's super common. People notice it, but rarely do you do surgery. Correct. Got it. I, I will say that when patients that we send you who've had cataract surgery um, have it done, they seem to do quite well, and yep. they're very pleased afterwards because... I don't know, maybe they're expecting perfection or optical perfection, and the, the vitreous seems to be somewhat visually significant, and when it's removed, they seem to do quite well. What, what do you think? Oh, I totally agree. They're some of my happiest patients. There's no question. Those that really have significant floaters, uh, especially those that have had cataract surgery, man, they really notice the difference when those floaters are removed. Is there a, a feeling in the retinal community that vitreous opacities are should be considered more visually significant? Uh, than they want, were once considered? There's no question. I think yeah. people are starting to identify this reality. Uh, we're seeing our patients being very happy, those that have the vitreous removed, uh, and, and do notice that, hey, they definitely see, see, see better. Uh, so I think there is becoming more of an appreciation that, hey, that vitreous has more visual significance than we're realizing, especially when it's with those associated opacities. And it can be very distracting to patients. Got it. Anything else you want to say? Well, I appreciate you having me, and thank you, and, and congratulations on your on your on your YouTube channel. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Pepe. Uh, let me think here. That's about it. What else do you think, uh, Retina? Anything you'd want to say about Retina, or that you'd want the general public to know about when to see a Retina specialist? Et you know, I, listen. If you're asking, I think one of the biggest things that we have found that there's a need, a public service need, if you will, is any patients that have diabetes. Uh, the important that they have their retina screen because we have phenomenal treatments now that prevent diabetics from losing their vision. Historically, that's the number one cause of vision loss in working age adults. And we really have uh, 
pharmaceuticals or drugs now that we use to inject in the eye that have a profound effect on preventing that vision loss. And that's something that if you have loved ones that are diabetic or you're diabetic, just make sure you're getting your eyes screened because we can prevent you from ever losing any vision. Uh, that would be kind of a public service announcement uh, uh, that I'd like to give. Awesome. Thank you. My that, pleasure. That's a wrap. All right. Thank Good you, Good job. What time is it? 8.15? No problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good. All right. All right, dude. That's Good. Fun.